So now this is the time to listen to Dr. Wang Jun. Although he has already been introduced earlier, while my colleague Anish Kinani, then Professor P.K. Gupta introduced him, and very quickly I would like to mention that he is one of the leading scientists and highly prolific author in highest standard journals of the world. For scientific achievements, Wang Jun has been recognized with several awards in China and at international level. These awards include His Royal Highness Prize Foundation, Young Elite Scientist from the Danish Research Council, Outstanding Scientist and Technology Achievement from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and he has more than <coughs> 100 outstanding journal articles of which many are published in high impact sector journals including Nature, Nature Genetics, Nature Biotechnology, Nature Review Genetics, Science, Genome Research, etc. And he has been recognized as one of the top 10 genomic scientists who published largest number of papers in Nature, Science and Cell series for several years. Now I don't want to come between you and his presentation. And the dignity has already gone down on the respective chair, so now we are having only one on the stage to perform. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, I'm very happy to be here. This is my second time uh, to have a um, uh, It's a very attractive uh, um, our web um, uh, um, organization um, and the uh, committee here. I already had a three uh, surprise uh, in a very short time this morning. Uh, the first surprise is I was invited to uh, uh, sit uh, on the stage. I just have to go. Uh, I'll sit uh, straight and I can still um, really close my phone or computers if I normally do. Uh, so it's, it's quite um, uh, amazing that I uh, still do a little bit. Uh, that's the first surprise, but then I had a se second surprise. I got a like, um, forty whatever verses. Uh, um, I never got any flower rose from my wife, you know. Yeah. Um, but I would bring it back, yeah, to my wife. Uh, but that's really um, a, a second surprise. And third surprise is I, I got this uh, petition from uh, um, a people who talk uh, about. Uh, about um, downside, I'm really happy because I'm already one of the orders to sign that. Uh, but they are already what uh, the average age is about 23, um, I'm pretty good from uh, this grade. Uh, I'm approaching to, uh, to be a, a senior scientist. I'm here to uh, help to sort of uh, brief the uh, This is still fine. Right? Yeah. So um, I'm here just trying to report all these young scientists who are both um, in um, BGI and of uh, course um, operate with my vision um, into the whole sites. Um, just trying to say uh, the digital revolution of agriculture is actually getting mm -hmm. from it's actually the uh, uh, this title is getting from this foundation when we uh, met uh, the chair this time last Friday when you know Bill Gates organized a uh, wonderful workshop talking about digital revolution in agriculture. And I immediately love that title. I use it any of my agricultural parts. It's just really and it's based on omics data, which I put a subtitle as omics based agriculture development. Um, biology is really difficult. It's not that easy. It's not that simple. Not that easy. So it takes lots of different dimensions, different levels of data. And those data are quite crazy. So this is the reality. That's the reason that DGI, if you look at all these kinds of mathematicians, the best reason to deal with the data. It's actually have full expect the mathematician is too clean to deal with the data and the biology biologists who somehow don't really know how to deal with it. So the physicist that has a perfect background to use all these kind of mathematical algorithms to store the data, which is exactly what biology is looking for. 
um, if we talk about omics, I mean, there's lots of so-called omics in the world. It's just to tell you one thing. This is a very important concept. That is why it's really difficult. Except any of those whatever analytic uh, signaling people are trying to figure out and try to make it as a uh, non-digital world, but it's, it's actually as simple as like it's really digital. If you have the right tools to digitalize any level of information in a very whole picture level, it's actually the first simple way if you really want to draw inclusion of a uh, formula based on all those kinds of um, because biology has become information, there is a new way of doing science like doing data driven science, not just hypothesis driven science. I heard many, many sort of, I mean, I, I basically dropped out of um, biology study. I was thinking this is not I was really sort of paid to study biology. This is no way I could. Any interest of the fundamental uh, beliefs belong to which you know uh, species or this and that. It's simply not my interest. Uh, but then I actually moved to the artificial intelligence world, which is actually uh, quite happy because they use genetics and computers combine them together. We started to understand something different. I actually joined the group before BGI when we started the Human Genome Project. That's actually the first data driven project in the world, now we are applying in the science and technology. We started to uh, uh, hypothesis free, that means there was actually no any hypothesis, it was just generated data for the first human genome. We sort of draw out every single base pair of human genome. Then we started to figure out what's in life. That's how we understand the information and what we need to model. Um, and of course, we got to applications in the future. Those models eventually might uh, understand will become a dominant model for this century's model. Of course, I'm not trying to exclude any of those hypotheses in the research. Actually, I even put it uh, here as you need to concept the hypothesis after you really generate the big data. But I'm just trying to say, you should not put this part beforehand. Um, just like if you don't really know what is the elephant look like, you don't try to put it before. Uh, when you actually uh, know what the elephant looks Even we are having great data, you know, there have been lots of data, but I think we're still missing um, a lot of, lot of data. One of the reasons is why you're so difficult to deal with the data, why it's so difficult to do all the statistics of those data, because the data is incomplete. The signal was incomplete is the noise. And that's the reason why it's not that easy to get the signatures. The only way to do it is to get the full picture of something. Um, to start in life, again, it's not that easy, right? So we could do a very small data set by just doing observation. And sometimes people start to step into the experimental biology that first generated models. But if you ever try to say to do the phenotype from the phenotype from animal, you need a very, very large data to perform what we call the hyperasis uh, which absolutely yeah, is the future. So the um, the intrinsic rules in life would be finally by what is that discovered by large scale efficient data position analysis. If you look at all these data exponential growing and actually the uh, cost sequencing cost is dropping down very uh, fastly, you know uh, it's not very far uh, from that. Uh, to my sort of extent, I think there's actually three key steps to the next generation of our project, which not necessarily to have the consequence that we have to sort of understand before we use. Uh, I will actually try to address them for instance. But most of those that I ever worked in this um, uh, omics study, the first one was the reading all this information and find out the right tools and give the most accurate and cheapest, high efficient information, this information. And the second part is always trying to do that make some notes here and there to understand the data, but 
from this part, what I say is converting the information into the model. And then the third part is always trying to use the knowledge to develop any application you know, uh, here, particularly reading uh, as one of those uh, uh, applications. Um, generating all the omics data has been really, really become sort of some mutant sound, or what I like to call mutant sound of noise levels. It's been very, very fast. Um, I didn't really draw. One more uh, dot here is actually an entrance. If you put it here, it's uh, also flat. That reflects um, the dominant situation of the uh, which also tells you probably that's not a good thing because um, uh, if nobody competing with them, they will stay at the price. Uh, it's already for uh, two or three years. So I'm a DJI with the acquisition competing on this, it's trying to prove that, so make it even down. Further to another level. But this is the current case. Right? So if you look at the um, uh, market uh, for the sequencing, now uh, it's almost basically more than 80% of the mean of it. Um, there, is a, there are actually two basic technologies to uh, generate data. One is sequencing, the other is messaging. Um, at least those are the two biggest two uh, platforms in DJI to generate the data. From sequencing, you can do basically here, from DNA to RNA to even proteomics, people are really studying sequencing, the sequencing to study proteomics and metabolomics. But mass spectrums particularly work for those two parts. And, um, but you know, um, sequencing is a very powerful tool, of course, that has been recognized to start from DNA, but then epigenetics lab or RNA lab or Uh, it's not just uh, those so-called omics data, though, right? Because this is with the, um, the molecular data I put it here as being manipulating molecules. They still need to connect in, you know, the environment data, uh, the soil data, the phenotype data here. And we, of course, try to upload it from a cloud system, which now uh, become more and more uh, question in uh, this uh, work. Um, but this is the whole data set we want to connect. People are moving very fast. But this part is very slow and phenotype. If they're talking about soil a lot, they don't really connect the data there uh, for the uh, uh, soil data. The environment, of course, you have something, but that's very rough. And it's not really agriculture based. So that's another issue. So anyway, so those, those are the entire data. We should connect it uh, from all the way. The tools is always important. I'm only talking about here. Um, you, the, uh, we have already sequences which down to the scale, let's say a sequencing could be down to a scale of sequencing one cell. DGI uh, has been very really successful at just that uh, to you know developing all this technology for cancer study for this and but it's the same thing here in plants and animals. You can sequence one cell, not just DNA, but also RNA, but also DNA methylation. We can do single cell DNA methylation. We can do single cell um, uh, RNA transcriptome. We can do single cell genomics. We can do single cell proteomics. We can do single cell metabolomics. But this is already um, but the problem, of course, all those omics are not in the same cell. But you can do single cell for genomics and not a single cell for RNA, but you cannot combine them together. But that's a pity. That's actually what I see should be the future. To address that on a single cell level, but on the entire omics in one single cell. But, uh, but currently, it's only like single cell for one DNA, one you know, RNA receptor. And the future tools could be also involved real time. This is uh, another thing that DGI is very interested in. So now we can target the garden tree. So, for example, if we're doing RNA study, if we're doing transcriptome analysis, it's like you take a digital camera to a movie center. Right? So you take a photo of a movie, and you try to guess out the entire movie. But that's not the right thing to do. Right? The movie is a movie. So you just have to have a real time video camera to follow the entire movie. So this real time thing for the transcriptome and the photonics is to, it's the necessary tools for the future for any of those companies. So we can now follow like a dozen. Oh, 
you know, 12 genes, or something like that. You can follow that. We have a movie of those 12 genes. But it's not enough. We wanted to target 100 southern genes and see a movie if any of them or each of them are just an actor in a movie. We want to see these southern genes, how they act along the time different contexts. So this is what I see in the future phase two. And uh, eventually it will be a, a, a valid. And for the feature tools, it's also important. Right now, EGI per data production is you know, per G, one giga basically per second. But this actually technology should be upgraded to one petabyte per second. So that tells me we still have another room of uh, 1,000 times throughput increasing in the future. And that is only uh, possible with new technology. Let me just give you one, I will uh, tell you more examples there, but let me just tell you one thing. So for, uh, for the genome size as a maze, I say, um, or human. So with the biggest, largest sequencing capacity in the world, BGI could do 50,000 whole genome of maze study. 50,000 in one year. It's not enough. We want to sequence every single individual of males in the world, of women in the world. So if we do a million, we need 20 years. That's not possible. So you actually need the technology to be 1,000 times faster, higher throughput. Then you could really do it in one day, if possible. Um, this is what DJI is going to do uh, with the current sort of technology in hand. I, I believe we can do it. Uh, we could make another 10 uh, to 50 times increase already in a couple of years. But anyway, so this is what I'm trying to say. For the future tools, they have to be real time. You know, single cell, omics, omics on the entire, all omics in the entire one cell, and actually higher throughput. And more importantly, in the future, everything should be digitalized real time and put it. Um, I, I just gave you a few examples about the past that we developed already. The first thing, of course, is a Bilovo. This is the tool set we try to assemble a genome, a Bilovo genome. People hadn't sequenced it before for any species. It has been really, really developed, very sort of matured already in BGI. We finished up many, many of those genomes there. We were the first group to sort of prove that the shut reads could be used to assemble a uh, mammalian size genome. Uh, at that time, we published 10 months ago. Uh, we were the first group to sequence rice genome many, many years ago, but we are already 12, 13 years ago. So we have right technology. People are achieving back to back at the very beginning for the human genome. Then uh, we uh, sort of developed the whole genome for the rice, so they moved to the rice. Now it's come back again, just because of lots of complexity of the genome. So people started to do it again, but in a different form, to reduce the uh, sequencing capacity. So it has like um, really evolution from back to back, the first generation sequencing for the human genome, and for the uh, first genome sequencing for the rice genome, that's the whole genome sequencing. And started the second generation sequencing, this is the panda, and started the uh, OGM sequencing with optical mapping, for example. This is just the one tool for the uh, very quick physical mapping um, uh, there, uh, genetic and physical mapping. There. So this is actually become a very standard uh, already. Uh, this is so paper in uh, Nickel Biotech. Then we started to do a, a whole genome sequencing with Fosmo tool. So that means, you know, back again to this, you know, uh, single clone level stuff. We uh, have a Fosmo library, we sequence each Fosmo, so we don't need to to a physical map or genetic map, just you know, sequencing the entire possible library and assemble the models. Uh, the, in the near future, this is the right technology to do. So if you actually have, I will sort of mention this LFR technology uh, 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 in the next few slides. This is the technology acquired from uh, complete genomics. So um, probably some of you know that complete genomics now is BGI wholly owned subsidiary. Uh, Interview uh, San Francisco. So we've already uh, sort of did this, just trying to tell you the, um, the overall 
acknowledge that um, they have a very nice throughput uh, sequencing platforms there. We could generate a lot of data, so just the possibility uh, we could sequence one million genome in one platform, because one million human genome in one platform in one year. Uh, this is the goal next But when we talk about, um, let's say, a genome, a reference genome, we only talk about a haploid genome. This is actually a problem. Uh, for example, human genome, even we say a reference genome has been really done by 3,000 scientists over six countries and many, many years, but that's only three billion base pairs. But we know for any individual, we have six billion base pairs. They have different, they have two haplotypes. Right? But they, we don't really have haplotype based information in the reference, even the first genome yet. So the technology is, uh, is very important. We need to not just getting one you know, mixture. Uh, three binning base pair uh, for human genome, for example, we actually need it to be two uh, based genomes. Uh, then it's LFR technology. Basically, uh, I just they published paper on this um, LFR technology. It basically, first of all, sort of fragment the DNA into 100 kg model. This is all these DNA fragments to uh, the sort of connected. It's like a back library. Then they barcode each DNA, each 100 kb DNA, and sequence it. They assemble it back at the 100 kb level. 100 kb back to the whole genome, to a phase the whole genome. So that is very easy because you actually, if you do many, many meetings of fragments, so that would be a very huge coverage of the genome. So you can get it down. In a very fast. So eventually, as I mentioned to you, for the DNA you fragment into this whatever 100 kb level, you buckle them, and you sequence them, they actually could assemble back. So those things could be used for reference in global assembly, could be used in resequencing, but on the based with based information, could be used for better genomics, as I mentioned to you. With all these, you know, bacteria, and they could basically sequence those uh, sort of single clones of bacteria. They they assemble back to the species level. So those are all uh, the stuff we could do based on this LFR uh, below the assembly. And the next generation of complete genomics machine would would be all have this uh, technology in you know, a very fast way. So up to now, we have already finished up close to seven hundred uh, animal references. That covers basically most of the important agricultural species. Some of them are very useful species. For example, uh, you know the uh, uh, palm oil tree, macaw silk form, and things like that. And we also have a so-called digital library uh, project, like G10K, I5K. Recently, we just sequenced you know uh, many many birds. So we just initiated a project called uh, 10. You know, it's like we are going to sequence 10,000 birds, including some uh, birds. Those things will be very helpful because, uh, you know, you, with all those genetic digital museums, they, not just from the evolutionary perspective, but also from functional study of different gene catalogs and you know, families will be very interesting. Uh, the technology still remains for the highly repetitive, you know, heterogeneity, polyploid uh, genome. But we are getting, with the LFR technology, we are getting sort of easier and easier to uh, tackle the problem in a very cheap way. You know, real food. That's the first uh, example. The second example for the reading is actually to resequencing uh, many of those species. We have the proper tool to do, you know, a single nuclear trap polymorphisms, insertion deletions, structure variations there. I mean, for any of them. But after all, we think in the future, the best way is actually to do the global assembly for each individuals and not really to do so called in secret. Because everybody's genome is different. Every individual's genome is different. So if you're really ever going to decipher the complete diversity of that, you need to do the global assembly. If they, are, if they cannot even map to the reference, how you can get a variation. So this is exactly right, especially for plant genomes. As lots of those so-called novel sequences, huge complexity 
of such variations uh, when we assemble tools, at least locally, for those kind of uh, information. The third example, of course, is the only ambiguous solutions. We have lots of, uh, again, I told you already, uh, the army army, you know, small army, long coding army stuff, everything. Right? And uh, more importantly, the DNM isolation become more and more uh, sort of interested. And uh, we can easily do uh, either a uh, whole metronome pair or IIDS with all this sort of enriched uh, uh, way of matching all the uh, isolation signals. Well. So I'm going to skip that part so it's kind of routine already. So we basically started from genome to the phenotype. If you look at the epigenetics, you know, long coding on the proteins, metabolomics, phenotypes, uh, you need all kinds of tools. Uh, and DJ right now has already developed almost all of them. But we still need to, again, as I told you, the level has to be upgraded. So the BGI efforts on reading already is about 100 species, 50k variation strengths has been sequenced, over 100k test genomes, over 10 k epigenome, whole genome epigenome. So it's the, the number is really growing exponentially every year. The second, uh, nature has always looked like a horrible mess, which they are. Um, but as we go along, we see patterns and perceive it together. Certain this is exactly what people want to do. Can we predict the phenotype phenomenon? And how we could, I, I actually never questioned about that, but I'm, my question is like how you predict the phenotype from the Annotate the genome has become very routine. Right? So we published this paper uh, about a half year ago about uh, the Macket Norwet, which is quite an uh, important species. Very long, very leaf is not in density. And um, if you look at all their phenotypes, uh, uh, just by sequencing one genome with many, many transfer comps, we have lots of hypotheses of different genes. And I put it some examples there. For example, the chart genes there, for the aging and longevity there, you know, the HIV, uh, FI1 genes there for hypoxia and all this. You know, we, we have all kinds of um, series, hypotheses. You can do lots of function analysis. Block cross bond genes, everything. They become very routine. Um, but that's just the one genome, right? And also very, very easy, low-handed tools that you can collect people already. I mean, normally people are doing these things by homology also like stage, which means already people did functional analysis, the software in some other species, and you have you know guessed out probably this is the annotation But there is a still a huge amount of unknown sort of undiscovered. A function of different genes or how you deal with them. There is a really kind of analysis is kind of bottleneck there. If again look at this genotype of uh, sort of uh, the phenotype from this sort of linear way there, you need to decode the system from parts to the phenotype. Um, the final output of this step is a equation, as we know, the x omics condition. Equals to z. The, the, the sort of uh, formula or equation is quite easy to be applied for the monetary it's, it's Sometimes it's quite sort of simple by a miniature analysis. Get it. Uh, but most of the case are uh, much, much more difficult. It's, it's not a, sort of multiple uh, are very, very difficult. Not just trying to mention in the gene and environmental. You need tools. People develop lots of tools. You start a you know, market development, QDL mapping, this and that. We have UAS analysis, I will mention a few of them. Now. But there's two points I want to uh, sort of emphasize. First one, a situation is different with speciality. Uh, all those tools, majority of those tools, we to study a situation. We study why this genomic data is associated and the second one, of course, you need a functional analysis for the candidate genes, which is the most essential part to understand. We have different um, ways to do that. This is a lineage of uh, Chinese rice, which you know, have different phenotypes there, uh, 
And the sequencing is higher than it, whole genome. And you can see the gene flow. You see, actually, those gene fragments flow, you know, to the F2, F1, you know, with all this kind of gene flow. Then, sort of, together with this gene flow, with the phenotype changes there, you can easily, or not that easy, but you can sort of do it there to find sort of map all these diseases. This is just one sample. If you have a good population of analysis, sequence of them, doing the phenotype of them, for uh, the entire population, and try to make the links. Or, this is the first step. If you don't really have any phenotypes, how you could uh, have some sort of idea about functional genes, this is based on selection. You can do, uh, this is what we found uh, many years ago. So we could sequence lots of those cultivated and wild flies and try to see why how those genes, uh, or what which genes uh, were selected during the domesticated process. Because the uh, farmers has been worked uh, for like uh, thousands, ten thousands of years, just trying to uh, demonstrate those genes. And the genetic world has a huge difference in uh, so the genes. So in this last study, we found that farm has a pretty good um, issues. So, but there is actually, started from this 500 genes, and we try to do in transgenic platform the function analysis and to see what is the function of those genes looks like. Uh, this is another way of doing that. Or you're doing GWAS. This Manhattan plot for the human GWAS study for any complex disorder. It's very, very formula, probably uh, formula to uh, uh, audience here. But it's actually recently was introduced into RISE. Uh, Quite easy, right? So you get a, a, a large connection of something that you do a genome wide association. The best way to the whole genome level uh, sequence is we try to find out all these kind of all our ways that uh, if you have statistically significant connection. Um, with all those uh, associations, uh, the gene functions through a network. Right? So it's not just the one gene. So you need to understand the entire system style. You need to actually bridge the gap from It is the most bottleneck. I didn't see any convincing technology in the world with large scale study genes function in the network pattern. So that makes it very difficult. That makes it a hugely bottleneck for, let's say, the step of understanding. So this is the reason why, if you're doing all those whatever breeding, the existing known knowledge to gene, it will be in the difficult. There is another factor, although people are always trying to neglect, is the bacteria or the virus. Uh, people has been started, the human, this is BGI published in Twitter. We first together with Meta Hood Group uh, in Europe, so we actually uh, established the gene catalog for the human class of bacteria. That is about over a thousand genes, a uh, thousand species. Um, but regarding to the soil, which of course the complexity, the complexity is off scale. Let's say we probably have you know hundred thousand different species in a very simple sphere centimeter uh, uh, soil, rich soil. So it would be very difficult to go started from single microbials up to the soil. Just to give you hints about what we found for the human, so this is what, what we found for type diabetes. So although we know the genetics play an important role for type diabetes, but in China, back to 30 years ago, in China, the uh, type diabetes is only 0.3 percent, but now it's 11 percent, and 50 percent are pre diabetic. I think India is even worse. But anyway, so we as you know, developing countries. So they started this type diabetes become a big issue, but not necessarily to be only genetic. If you look at the gut bacteria, so there is some of those bacteria are really enriched into the type diabetes. In Chinese patients, we find this bacteria, if they have the bacteria, they must have the diabetes. And if they do a kind of fecal transplantation from healthy donors to those uh, patients, people did that. They saw few cases in the basin, they actually shows up very interesting. So again, 
it tells you that those kind of gut bacteria is another genome of human for the metabolic uh, uh, different process there. But if you think about the crops and the soil, the soil is the gut of the crops. But people just didn't really sort of do that. Now you have the proper tool to understand uh, the soil and the genomics. But with the complete genomics technology, we hope in the next few years we will really sort of uh, launch and, and take off for the soil and the genomics um, The third step, okay, so I mentioned the second step. Basically, it's, it's not, I mean, people could solve some of those understanding issues, converting information to knowledge, but it's too far too slow. And I don't really think they can do it for the entire gene sets. Yeah interested. But can we, even without understanding, do some application? The answer is absolutely yes. The application is trying to design the desired, the desired crops. You want to desire sort of combine with different genes all together to create any phenotypes. Can we actually breed in the computer? Then the field. Uh, I completely understand that you cannot you know, just doing these purely sort of theoretical stuff, never go into the field, you don't know how to breed stuff. But, but can we, uh, using the most efficient way to fish, which I think is dry out the weather, not using fishing sticks, not using fishing the best way, the most efficient way to fish, dry out all the water. You cannot dry out all the water in the field. The only way to dry out all the water is in the computer. If you have a gene plasm of 10,000 different varieties, 10,000 different varieties times 10,000, that's 100 million. It's not possible to do it on a field. You can easily do it. But can we actually sort of understand it, try to surpass it from the information directly to the knowledge or to the applications and not go through the middle step of trying to understand that? I think the answer is also yes. But Jeff wrote a very, very nice review in Nature Biotech uh, last year. Yeah, I use it a lot of these slides. So this is actually, which I think is the most promising tool. So thinking, just forget about um, biology for a while. Forget about those functional analysis for a while. Just trying to link the genotype on the data to the phenotype just by theoretical prediction. If you sequence the entire rice genome, if you compare one rice genome to another, it gives you over meaning snips, one meaning snips. That means we actually have one meaning different data points for each individual. They try to come up with a theoretical mathematical model. If you sequence enough, I don't know which is enough, is turns out enough, is a meaning enough, you do whatever. Um, requires, let's say, 100,000 rights. With the complete rice genome sequence, for each individual, you have a meaning data point. Then you form a purely theoretical mathematic model to have a strong association between those data points to the phenotype you connect to the rice. Then probably by artificial intelligence, you know, machine learning technology, whatsoever, to create kind of very nice training set to predict just from a whole genome data to the phenotype. I would suspect for the rice, that number would be consulted uh, for the startup. But anyway, so this is one of the projects we'd like to do together with this company. Um, but this new uh, idea of doing it purely mathematically, uh, genomics, whole genome data, and phenotype data, combine it. For the future research, I think it will be a very promising. You don't really have to understand each the function of each team. So you can start it with reading this case time, this kind of strong mathematic models. Uh, we did something for the moment, but that's not based on genomics. This is always my, uh, uh, my wish. So uh, together with this work, probably we will accelerate the collaboration in the future. But this is absolutely. Uh, what we are aiming for. And I don't know if uh, Daniel will talk more about this country rice genome project, so, but this is what we are uh, 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 
Anyway, so this is part of this. Yes, uh, uh, part of the part of the type of time from this line, we will respond to this template problem. So we finish that script. So we need to do it more. I think this whole project, uh, probably will be good to do the dynamic kind of Reading cannot wait. So for any of those McVitie's open top, the good thing is that with the technology I just mentioned, you don't really have to uh, have very deep understanding of any uh, species. Even for those liquidated open top, you could start to do it right now if you have enough energy uh, or phenotype or phenotype or even to do it, even to stop on this one. And uh, talks for a minute is something. That, that's really totally stuff up. And I have to think animal would be even better because they can do IVF, cloning, whatever, would be even better. Uh, the next few slides is based on the evolution of molecular breeding, how, what, how you do that structure. Uh, right now, it's the traditional breeding here, right? So, you know, farmers basically, you have uh, uh, milk processors, and milk structures, and milk structures, and breeding, or whatever. You have all these kind of traditional. In the future, you will be really started from genomic selection model or association duplication curve. You will be a much shorter uh, from this line. So. But that requires a lot of things. That requires breeding center, an omic center, and a data center, and a computing center, a phenotype environment. Obviously. I'm not talking about farmers. Here. They don't talk to you. They don't understand. Uh, I don't think any sort of breeding can do those really are. And omics and uh, do the omics and the breeding, you know? So I think the first barrier for them to work together is tremendous. I mean, can everybody understand each other? And do we uh, sort of understand how to uh, form a real sort of breeding um, Then the second phase, of course, is how to really collect all these environmental data so, and soil, for example, and uh, all these kind of materials uh, and other things. Very, very difficult because you have you know kind of different you need the expert system you need machine learning technology you need artificial intelligence um the architecture of data center is also very very difficult so people have to be used to work with computers like this field so you need a huge data like data warehouse you need to you have data applications you entrance for the reason of data slower entrance i don't know about Agricultural part, probably it's better, but for the medical part, it's very, very difficult for people to share the community data and how to really set up firewalls where the data are being started from different projects, different individuals, different uh, collaborators, all working together at you know, a, 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 a same data warehouse and started to do different applications. That would be uh, quite difficult. Not mentioning physically, they have to be everywhere in the world. If you develop anything, you want it to be, you know, sort of planted as any place as possible. So that in that case, you need to practice all this. And your breeding centers and actual farmers are everywhere in the world. And you can find out the cheap solution to generate the farmers data. You can find out the cheap solution to analysis data to deliver the applications to the farmers of these breeding centers. Set any sort of mobile phone applications that for that. Things like that has to be solved in the future. So eventually, hopefully, in 20 years, probably in agriculture could be possible. So some species probably in five years, ten years, I don't know. This structure will be ideal in the future. You need to have a breeding research center to have phenotype connection testing and recording work. You need to have field farmers that can model and data being data analysis through remote flow. We have a data huge data center there with the only center to have separate classes there. So those four key elements there would be very essential. And I don't know if there is any country or any research industries or, or even companies have that kind of um, But I think we will have it in the future. Okay, so um, the time is, is about. Um, uh, so I um, give all this acknowledgement to one of those people. I guess these are people um, uh, in the act, uh, in the these are research, the act, uh, uh, this foundation, um, uh, and the kind of advice.
with you. Those are very wonderful collaborators in India. So, uh, so it's a pleasure that uh, we, um, we meet uh, in this. Uh, but anyway, so all the other collaborators of India are at um, Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Wang Jun. So I think after listening this presentation of this talk, I can say only, wow, it's simply impressive. Let's thank once again, Wang Jun. I think you can take the seat.